Please stay tuned for important disclosure information at the conclusion of this episode. Welcome to the Investing Insights Podcast from Morningstar. In this week's podcast, we are pleased to present Coronavirus Insights, Economic Impact, Vaccine Update. Preston Caldwell and Karen Anderson from Morningstar Research Services discuss the impacts COVID-19 will have on the economy and when we can expect a vaccine. Hey, everyone. I lead up our economics research here at Morningstar. And so I'll start us off talking about our near-term economic views pertaining to the period while COVID-19 epidemic is still ongoing. And after that, I'll turn it over to Karen, who will cover all things related to the disease itself, including our forecast for disease spread and fatalities. And she'll cover what kinds of social distancing measures, including reduced visits to non-essential businesses, will be required to achieve those forecasts. Needless to say, all of her analysis factors in heavily to our economic forecasts. Finally, after Karen is done, I'll wrap up by covering our long-run economic views. We're forecasting just a 1% negative impact to the long-run level of GDP. Um, that is a fairly small long-run economic impact compared to what many others have discussed. So this is really the biggest takeaway uh, from an economic point of view of the presentation. So I'll start briefly in covering our short-term views. We're forecasting a 3.9% a fall in U.S. GDP growth in 2020 and a 2.4% fall in global GDP growth. That incorporates a, um, a 600 basis point impact from COVID-19 on the U.S. Um, and a 550 basis point impact on average for the world as a whole. And you could see that, that impact column um, a second column from the left there showing the, the impact of COVID-19 on economic growth for 2020. Um, and the table illustrates how we expect growth to play out for each region. Uh, you can see broadly we're expecting a similar impact across each major region with um, the Eurozone being hit a little bit worse in the U.S. given um, the greater degree of shutdowns we've seen there. Uh, on the flip side, we see Japan and some of the other advanced economies being hit less because um, they've managed to contain the virus uh, without as much economic damage so far. Um, and um, our, uh, our GDP forecast um, in terms of our methodology relies on month-by-month -month timelines of the disease spread and reduction in visits to non-essential businesses. And so what we do is we look industry by industry uh, to see how that's going to affect GDP on an economy-wide basis. Um, and specifically, we look at the U.S. economy and, and benchmark that as uh, to create our expectations for the rest of the world. And so here, what you can see in this chart is a um, disaggregation of, of U.S. GDP by industry, and we classify each industry to the extent to which it's um, – fallen within uh, businesses that are exempted from the shutdown orders that we've seen and largely um, less impacted from social distancing measures. So that's in the less left column right there. And that accounts for about 70% of U.S. GDP as a whole. And that leaves about 30% of GDP, uh, which have been impacted by the shutdown orders. But uh, of that 30%, you can see the middle column, about 14% of U.S. GDP worth of industries are able to continue their operations in remote or online form. Um, and so that means even with widespread implementation of, of shutdown orders and social distancing, only about 16% of U.S. GDP um, at the industry level is highly impacted by the shutdown orders um, and social distancing that we've seen. Now, that doesn't that doesn't mean also that these um, non-impacted industries aren't seeing knock-on impact from low, lower overall economic demand. That's that's certainly a factor. But um, the key point of this slide is that you know the um, the shutdown orders that we that we've seen and the social distancing are hardly commensurate with a an in, uh, shutdown of the entire U.S. economy. Um, our data suggests that for the U.S. overall, visits to non-essential businesses troughed in March at roughly 65 percent below pre-pandemic levels. Um, as the shutdown orders are lifted and we make progress on testing and treatments, we're expecting that non-essential visits rebound to roughly 30 percent below pre-pandemic levels by the end of this year. 
Uh, and additionally, there's flexibility for industries to increase their output even when uh, visits don't go up. Uh, the e-commerce is the most concrete example of that where um, uh, we can um, increase our consumer expenditure without uh, increasing um, non-essential visits. Now, when will we see the direct impact of COVID-19 on the economy abate entirely? Uh, most likely, that's um, dependent most on the advent of a vaccine. And we're expecting a widespread availability of a vaccine in the, to um, increase in the first half of, of 2021, as Karen will talk about in more detail. And that should remove any lingering direct impact of the virus um, on the economy. Now, even with once the direct impact of the virus goes away, we'll still have the um, fallout from reduced consumer and business confidence and consumer and business demand. Uh, and key to mitigating that fall in demand will be the um, uh, fiscal stimulus that we expect to see. So um, we're we're expecting U.S. Um, debt to GDP, or the U.S. deficit to GDP ratio to increase by roughly 1,200 basis points um, in 2020, and that's a historically large level of stimulus. In fact, it even outpaces what we saw after the Great Recession, as well as the New Deal era. The only thing that comes close is uh, the World War II ramp up and military expenditure, which lifted the U.S. out of the Great Depression. Why is fiscal stimulus important? Um, you know, even in the short run, COVID-19 is both a supply and a demand side shock. So fiscal stimulus will curtail that demand side impact. In the long run, we'd argue that COVID-19 is almost entirely a demand side shock because once the outbreak has been contained, um, the productive capacity of the economy will largely be unimpaired. Uh, to the extent the economy continues to remain depressed, it will be purely because of lackluster demand, and fiscal stimulus can help offset that. Uh, I'll talk about our long-term view more in a, a few minutes, but for now, I'll turn it over to Karen. Great. Thank you, Preston. All right, so starting out with the slide, our, our May 11th report uh, updated some of our assumptions for the impact of COVID-19 in the U.S. And so I thought I, I would start here. Uh, so for this analysis, our colleague Debbie Wong also contributed her diagnostics expertise to help us get a better sense of the tools that we have right now at our disposal to, to continue to fight the outbreak as we relax the lockdown. So I'll start by giving you a general sense of our expectations and our three scenarios, um, as well as where we stand today. And then I'll talk in a little more detail uh, on potential treatment and vaccine timetables. So starting where we are today, uh, the table here uh, shows the end of April. There were at least 56,000 COVID-19 related deaths at the end of April. There have been closer to 100,000 as we approach the end of May. Our assumptions for total deaths for 2020 have narrowed significantly. So we see a, a smaller range of outcomes between our scenarios for the remainder of the year. So this is really tied to the fact that the following our stay at home orders for most of the US beginning in March, we now know what sort of social distancing we're capable of when our healthcare system is at risk of being overwhelmed. And we're also get, starting to get a sense of our ability to slowly relax this lockdown without seeing a massive spike in new cases. So the variation on our scenarios right now is mostly tied to how we implement the relaxation of the lockdown. So a base case assumes some overshooting, while bear case involves more rapid relaxation of multiple restrictions. And the bull case shows a slow and steady relaxing of measures that wouldn't trigger any increase in cases or any reversals of the relaxed measures. So on testing, we got to around 250,000 tests a day by the end of April, but capacity is improving. So tests are inching north of 400,000 today, at least they're steadily above 350,000 or so. Uh, we think that can continue to improve significantly throughout the end of the year. So our bullish case there might require more innovation in the types of tests that we have, uh, potentially more lab space for testing platforms or more prioritization of COVID-19 tests over other tests. Uh, but the base and the bear cases are, are closer to the level of testing that we think we're, we're actually capable of today. Uh, 
So overall, most epidemiologists think we need somewhere between 500,000 and a million tests a day in order to control the pandemic. In our May 11th update, we estimated that the U.S. has access to probably more than 600,000 tests a day. Uh, there have been a lot of obstacles standing in the way of meeting that level of testing. Many of these issues are tied to uh, shortages of other supplies like, like swabs or protective equipment. Uh, those are slowly being worked out, but we also um, probably more importantly, lack a centralized IT and logistics system overseeing our, our testing. Uh, and that, that would be something that could make sure that tests are tracked and routed to the areas that have the most capacity. So we're making progress to that recommended range. Um, I think it's within the realm of feasibility, but it's gonna take time to sort out the logistics. So, so one of the biggest questions uh, today and something that ties in with what Preston was talking about seems to be you know, how, when and how are we relaxing the restrictions on the economy? And so we've updated our assumptions on non-essential visits. So this is um, you know, when we'll return to more normal activity like going to restaurants and gyms and movie theaters um, and how that's gonna evolve over the, over the course of the year. So as Preston mentioned, the um, non-essential visits did bottom out around 65% below pre-pandemic levels. By the end of April, this was about 45% below. And so in our base case, we now assume we'll be at about 30% below uh, by the end of the year. We may see a couple points where this progress reverses slightly if we relax too far too quickly. And so on this slide, this gives a, a very rough idea of how this could all evolve. So first, just explaining the graph, it mostly focuses on 2020. The blue section at the end is kind of a condensed version of 2021. The left y-axis shows um, RT, which is basically the number of people who are infected by, by any one person with the disease. The orange line, uh, horizontal line, is RT of one. So that's basically where uh, infection rates would stay steady. Anything below that means that the virus is in the process of being contained. So before lockdown, we were clearly above one uh, without any restrictions on our behavior. It was probably closer to two or two and a half. Some epidemiologists put that number even higher. Going into early May, we were at a point where transmission was falling uh, to dip below one um, in most states. So I plot that here on the, on the blue line. Uh, we think that's going to um, go back above one a couple times over the rest of the year. So one reason we think that'll happen is quarantine fatigue. And so this is something that's starting to affect states and starting to affect individual behavior um, outside of state guidelines right now. Um, and so then uh, we would assume a return to better control in July as we learn to maintain distancing again, maybe with some compromises. So, you know, maybe if we took the step to have more in-store shopping, maybe we take a step back and do something more along the lines of curbside pickup instead. So we think that the second reason uh, that there could be higher transmission later this year would be a, a return to school. So it's uh, far from certain that kids are going to be going back to school in the fall across the country. Um, also far from certain how that would affect infection rates in adults. Um, but based on experience in some countries that have reopened schools like Denmark, it looks like it does increase the risk of trans, uh, transmission overall, uh, making it easier for us to get that RT back above one again. But by the time we reach the fall, we think we'll have other factors moving in our favor. So um, availability of diagnostics, um, that's already improved significantly. Um, the improvement we expect to see this year, it's not ideal, but I think it's going to help on several levels. So, so first, we're just making sure we can actually diagnose people that have symptoms. Uh, that's making sure that they're, they're isolating themselves. And then the next step is to be able to uh, trace contacts for anyone, uh, contacts of anyone who's diagnosed. So uh, if any of these people test positive, then that's reducing the number of people circulating with the virus. So quarantining these contacts for two weeks stops them from passing it on if they, an infection does develop. Uh, and then there's another, um, another idea of random surveillance. So as we start to get more diagnostics capacity, we'll be able to test high risk populations. So uh, we're already testing um, some nursing homes. We could start a testing, testing um, essential workers, people returning to school and work. Um, you could also do wider testing in areas that are just seeing uh, higher growth in new cases to try to control outbreaks early. So all this should help prevent uh, further spikes in cases. <laughs> 
Uh, so we'll also start to see more availability of treatments and vaccines around this point as well, uh, going into 2021, particularly as we assume there's going to be a vaccine that would reduce transmission to the point where herd immunity would take over. So that would mean that there wouldn't be enough people in the population who were susceptible to the virus to really keep it going. So this is a snapshot of where we are in the US, really looking kind of at the past two months, uh, looking at uh, daily diagnosed uh, and daily testing rates. So you can see the, the gray, smaller bars at the bottom, those are uh, diagnoses per day. Uh, they increased in March and they've been kind of volatile, but relatively steady, maybe even trending down a little bit, staying in that range, roughly 20 to 30,000 uh, new cases a day. And so this is in an environment of uh, improved testing. So you can see the larger blue or blue bars there. Um, most recent testing numbers that were updated just at the beginning of this week show, as I mentioned, above th uh, 350,000 actually per day. So this combined uh, you know, flat diagnoses and increased testing actually does imply that we're having falling rates of new cases each day. We're just getting better at finding a high percentage of people who are getting sick. So we also want the positive rate. So that's the percentage of tests that come back positive. We want that to be below 10%. Uh, those are the WHO guidelines for sufficient testing. So in May, we have officially moved into this territory as a country. You can see the, the red line there uh, showing the positive rate and how that's been falling over time. If you extend this graphic out further through May 25th, it uh, shows we've gotten as low as a 5% positive rate overall, which is great news. Uh, some states, however, are still uh, lagging. So in the report, we have more details going into uh, the status really of each state and talking about some of the red flags we look for, like increasing cases, um, positive rates above 10%, um, increasing positive rates, which could either mean be, you know they're having more cases or they're not testing as many people. Either of those are, would be concerning. Um, and then also states that look like they're reopening too aggressively uh, based on combination of those. So we're less concerned with states that are seeing increases in cases if they're also increasing testing and maintaining or shrinking their positive rate. But it's very easy for these kind of stable situations to turn into rap rapid spread if restrictions are lifted too quickly. So as of our analysis, May 11th, we had only 15 states that had no red flags. Uh, after looking at some upstated stats at the beginning of this week, 12 more appeared to have kind of tipped the scales toward being ready for reopening. So most states do appear ready for a slow reopening, but there's really a broad range in ways this is being implemented and populations don't always abide by uh, the current level of recommendation, which is why we deal, do still in our base case expect a small, uh, potential smaller wave in June. Um, some particular regions too, like the Midwest and Northeast, they've seen broad improvements in the past few weeks, but there are some states that have concerning trends really all over the country. So Minnesota and North Dakota, for example, in the, the Midwest, um, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Alabama in the South, uh, Arizona in the Southwest. So it's really kind of a, a patchwork of states that I think are, are struggling at this point, but it changes um, every day. So this, um, this really highlights where we are now with, um, with treatments. Uh, the biggest change in treatments since our last update was the um, emergency use authorization uh, for Gilead's remdesivir. That happened May 1st. Uh, so remdesivir shortens the duration of the disease and potentially improves mortality rates in hospitalized patients. Uh, we expect more data later this month or in early June to help clarify uh, if certain patients do better than others um, depending on severity of their disease. Uh, Gilead's moderate patient trial is poised to read out shortly. Uh, we did see more details from the NIH study. That's the one that gave us the first controlled data and was really the basis for that emergency use authorization. That data was published actually just last Friday in the New England Journal of Medicine. So overall, that data appeared to point to uh, a better benefit for patients who are receiving oxygen but less benefit for more advanced patients who are already on mechanical ventilation. Mortality rates improved for those patients on oxygen. Uh, there were really 2% um, mortality rates for patients on remdesivir and more than 12% for patients on placebo, uh, but those rates, again, weren't statistically significant. 
Uh, we think the data looks it looks solid for remdesivir, but we do think there's clear room for improvement. So either by guiding the drug to the patients who uh, perhaps have been just put on oxygen or by combining the drug with other treatments. So along those lines, the NIH did expand the, the study of remdesivir to include combination with a drug from Lilly called Illumiant. This is an arthritis drug that could actually help with more of the, the inflammation-related complications. So as far as other in inflammation drugs, we also expect data from Roche's Actemra this month. Um, Sanofi and Regeneron's Kevzara is a, a drug that's very similar to Actemra, should have more data in June, but the initial results were disappointing. The trial um, has been narrowed to the high dose and to the more advanced, very critically ill patients because it, they failed to see a benefit over placebo in the um, severely ill patients. And then there, there, are many, um, there are many other drugs being studied as treatments, uh, a lot of repurposed immunology drugs, even oncology drugs. So generally speaking, these repurposed drugs are going to make up the first wave of potential treatments this year uh, because timelines for developing entirely new drugs would be much longer. Uh, remdesivir, uh, technically it wasn't actually an approved drug, um, but it was a repurposed drug in the sense that it was already designed to treat hep C and it had already been tested extensively um, in Ebola and earlier coronavirus models. And then the first targeted drugs, those would actually be uh, very likely to be antibody therapies. So Regeneron is a company that leads in this space. They're poised to start trials for an antibody cocktail in June. So this could work uh, on a couple levels. You could take it at a lower dose uh, to prevent infection for short periods of time, perhaps once a month. Uh, and then you could also take it at a higher, 10 times higher dose uh, to treat an infection. Uh, and we expect some limited availability of the CNE body perhaps this fall, uh, but manufacturing should take time um, and treatment is probably going to be um, more expensive as a result. And so I, I think beyond the, the ramp in diagnostics availability that we're seeing in, in Gilead's progress with remdesivir, the biggest news to me is really how quickly the vaccine pipeline is moving forward. So the timing of a vaccine being available is very uh, up for debate. Uh, we have, you know, there are some experts, Bill Gates, arguing uh, new technologies could allow for approval and uh, rapid approval in months. Uh, others are saying this is going to take years because that's been traditionally true for, for new vaccines. Um, overall, I think we've already dramatically shortened some of the steps to market for, for several of the vaccine candidates. So one, one big change is shown here on this slide, uh, kind of comparing more, more standard uh, practice with what's going on today. Um, one big change is that uh, there's significant funding for expanding manufacturing at risk. So companies don't normally uh, scale up manufacturing until they have positive data from trials. Um, on the development side, clinical trials are also normally sequential. So you normally wait till you have phase one data just before you start phase two. Firms are starting to stack their trials. So the minute they get a positive signal on safety in phase one, um, we've seen companies starting to run trials in parallel. Moderna is stacking trials um, and starting phase three in July. So they started phase one in March. Um, that kind of gives an example of how they're going to have, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three trials all kind of running um, in tandem. And so this, this kind of outlines, I guess, what I would call kind of a blue, blue sky scenario showing some of the top vaccine developers and what they could be capable of if, if everything goes smoothly in their clinical trials. So we think companies like Moderna, uh, Pfizer, Astra and J&J &J could all in theory see emergency use authorization by the end of this year. And five of the six listed here could all receive full FDA approval by 2021 in our view. Uh, so things are moving really quickly and I thought I'd just dive into a little bit of the data we've seen so far. Uh, all of this has been since we published this analysis just a couple weeks ago. So uh, the initial phase one data from Moderna, that was in mid-May, that was really encouraging. Uh, it showed it's tolerable. Um, 
showed neutralizing antibodies developing in these patients um, that are similar to or even higher than people who have already recovered from COVID-19. So all that kind of implies to me that the vaccine is likely protective. Um, so their timeline for starting phase three in July, that does fit with our analysis. Uh, one change since, um, since we published to this graphic would be uh, related to Astra and their partnership with Oxford. So they announced last week they had already started uh, a phase two, three trial and up to 10,000 volunteers in the UK. Uh, they plan to start a phase three trial in the US this summer. They plan to have data in August. So, and the, the goal is delivery of some vaccine to the UK in September. So this could shorten their timeline to be much more similar to, to Moderna's. Um, there's another vaccine here, um, not listed, Novavax. They've in, entered phase one, two in Australia. Uh, they, they're using their flu vaccine technology. Uh, and they've also got high capacity to make up to a billion doses next year. So that could be another significant player. Um, they expect to start a phase two trial in, in July and also perhaps could receive an emergency use authorization by the end of the year. Um, we've seen positive phase one data already. The first real published phase one data for a vaccine uh, by a Chinese firm, CanSino, uh, that was published in The Lancet. Um, but we haven't put CanSino or another Chinese manufacturer, Sinovac, into this analysis um, because of lack of data right now in terms of manufacturing capacity. Uh, but clearly that's good news um, that, that we've seen that published in The Lancet. So that could lead to another vaccine down the road. So we don't, uh, so just to kind of summarize, we don't, we don't expect all of these vaccines will succeed. There could definitely be uh, some speed bumps along the way with, uh, with trials, uh, manufacturing issues. But we think that if just say two of the six vaccines listed in this table were approved by early 2021, we could be in a position to supply billions of vaccines in 2021. And we do think the approval is going to be on a spectrum. We think uh, the FDA is um, likely to allow vaccination in, in healthcare workers and maybe some high risk populations uh, before kind of the general population of adults. And certainly I would say before children, as we would want to have longer term safety data for, for larger populations that are at lower risk from the virus. Um, but if we are still social distancing to some extent and seeing economic headwinds this fall, as I expect we will be, uh, the FDA is likely to lean in favor of earlier use of vaccines once we have the initial safety and efficacy data. And so this is really kind of what would allow us to reach that near normal non-essential visits by the middle of 2021. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Preston to focus on some of the, the long-term GD impacts. Thanks, Karen. So we're seeing some atrociously bad economic data coming in in the near term. Average unemployment, for example, reached 15% in April, the worst rate since the Great Depression. At the same time, investors have seen equity markets rally substantially over the past two months. And I think many now are wondering, are markets still grounded in reality or are we seeing irrational exuberance? Answering that question really means answering the question of what's going to happen to long run GDP. And we argue this is the most important question facing investors right now. Our philosophy at Morningstar is to value stocks on their long term cash flows. And if you share that philosophy, then your valuation of a typical stock is vastly more sensitive to the long run trajectory of GDP than it is to the short run hit. And that's what this table on the slide in front of you shows. Um, as you move down the table, um, you show the impact to a, um, a typical stock fair value um, relative to the change in um, 2020 uh, and, and following year GDP. Um, and as you move to the right side of the table, it shows you how the stock fair value varies with respect to the long run impact to GDP. So. Um, as you can see, the, the values, the hits to fair value get much worse as you move to the right side of the table, uh, which indicates that the sensitivity is much more to the long run impact than what happens in the next few years. Uh, we're forecasting just a 1% negative impact to the long run level of GDP uh, for both the U.S. and, and global. Uh, to be clear, this isn't a 1% lower growth rate that occurs year after year. Uh, it's a one-time uh, but permanent shift in the level uh, or trajectory of long-run GDP. 
Uh, and the best way to, to illustrate that is to look at um, what happened in the Great Recession, um, both for the U.S. and for the world as a whole. Uh, and that illustrates really a, a worst case scenario in terms of the impact of a uh, of long run GDP after a recession, uh, because for the U.S. Uh, GDP, as you can see on the right chart here, um, the red line, which was actual U.S. GDP, fell roughly 10 to 15 percent below its prior or pre-recession long run trend. Um, following the Great Recession, and the the long run trend is the the dotted line, um, the dotted red line for the U.S. Um, and you can also see gaps for uh, an even larger gap for the eurozone, as well as a gap for the world as a whole. So overall, the world economy seemed to have a long run impact on the level of output after the recession. Now. I, most investors probably are using the Great Recession as a, a mental model of what's going to happen after this recession. But it's it's worth noting that many recessions aren't like the Great Recession. Uh, historically, many recessions have seen a much more robust recovery in the long run of the level of GDP. And so that's why when we're, we wanted to answer the question of what is going to be the long run impact of the COVID-19 recession, we looked to a, uh, a broader history of U.S. and global recessions for guidance on a likely range of impact, um, as well as for the lessons learned in terms of the factors most likely to affect um, the long run impact of the recession. And as you can see, this slide shows um, the index level of output um, before and after recessions uh, for all post-World War II U.S. recessions. And in the, the bright red line, you can see the course of the Great Recession. And you can see it was fairly unusual in terms of the long year, the long run impact um, on GDP. Um, the chart extends out to five years after the recession. Um, and you can see that many recessions were um, seem to exhibit a V-shaped recovery on that time frame. They basically recovered to their uh, the long run trajectory before the recession. Um, and, you know, a, a great example for the U.S. of a, a V shaped recovery is what we saw in the 1981 82 recession uh, when U.S. Uh, output fell sharply as a result of a monetary policy contraction. Uh, that monetary policy uh, contraction was designed to curb the high rate of inflation that we had throughout the 1970s, persisting in the early 80s. And um, once the goal of taming inflation had been accomplished, um, you saw monetary policy shift back into a, an accommodative mode, and GDP bounced back sharply. Uh, and in fact, in that example in the 1981-82 recession, uh, the long-term impact on GDP of that recession was, was zero. In fact, actually, the, the trend rate of growth after the recession was faster than before the recession in terms of real GDP. Um, and perhaps that has some lessons uh, or some uh, analogies to the recession that we're going through right now insofar as uh, we're seeing a, a sharp but short-term a curb in the level of economic activity as a result of a external shock to the economy. Um, but the economy itself is fundamentally sound. Uh, we don't have, um, we didn't have imbalances in the economy or, or structural weaknesses going into COVID-19. And so once this external uh, cause of recession, which is the virus, uh, abates, uh, we'll be left with the economy we had before the virus, which in our view, wasn't uh, structurally impaired in any way. So we can also extend this historical analysis to looking at global recessions. And so what this chart shows is uh, results from our study of uh, post-World War II global recessions. Um, we looked at um, roughly um, 200 recessions occurring across about 50 countries globally for which we had comprehensive data. And the, the key message is that, again, here at a global level, um, uh, many recessions don't have a long run negative impact on the economy. Uh, and you can see the 84th percentile line, the, the bright blue line, um, ends up at 100% of uh, the, 
of pre-recession, the pre-recession trend and growth um, by the year five after the recession. And so what that means basically is that for um, at the 84th percentile, which would be 16% of recessions in this sample, um, you have a full recovery in output compared to the pre-recession trend. So no long run impact on GDP from the recession. And so that is at the top range of the sample, but that's that's still a, a large number of recessions. And in fact, other papers have found as many as 30% or more of recessions have no long run impact of GDP using a, a similar methodology as we do, but controlling for more variables. Um, and so it's certainly not a foregone conclusion that a COVID-19 recession will have a long-run impact on GDP. Now, because of the wide range of outcomes, we need to look at the specific factors that lead certain recessions to be very bad for long-run growth. Um, in, in that light, let's look first at the Great Depression, which um, Really, the key lesson from the Great Depression is that economic catastrophe is created by persistent economic policy error, most of all. And in the Great Depression, that took the form especially of the commitment to the gold standard. Um, the U.S. and global economies didn't collapse into the Great Depression overnight. Uh, instead, they worsened over a four-year period as central banks responded to a burgeoning financial crisis in the worst way possible by contracting the supply of money. And they did so because of this misguided commitment to the gold standard, because if they had uh, expanded the supply of money, it would have jeopardized their ability to um, maintain the gold standard because there would have been a run on gold reserves of countries participating. Um, that meant that countries could only switch to accommodative monetary policy until they exited the gold standard. And what we saw uh, across major economies was that as soon as the country left the gold standard and switched to accommodative monetary policy, the Great Depression troughed and we saw a rapid rebound in output. And so the left chart shows, you can see 1931, the UK was the first to leave the gold standard and, that's, and they were the first major economy um, to begin recovering from the Great Depression, and the trough level of GDP was was much lower. And then you can see, you know, the U.S. persisted until 1933 and saw a much worse hit in the economy. But then once they did leave the gold standard, once uh, Roosevelt came into office, uh, there was a sharp rebound in economic output, and France was the the laggard, and they saw a more protracted um, uh, d uh, trough in output. Um, another key lesson from the Great Depression is that um, even economic doomsday, uh, if you will, doesn't rule out a full recovery eventually. I mean, the Great Depression was catastrophic for a decade in terms of GDP. But once policy errors were corrected um, and the U.S. and global economies um, uh, deployed also widespread physical uh, stimulus, especially in the U.S. with World War II, we saw a robust recovery out of the Great Depression. And um, the U.S. even recovered to its pre-Great Depression trend, which is astonishing given that output, real output fell roughly 30 percent um, by the trough in 1933. So this suggests that we can cure the economy of long-run effects from even the worst economic downturn in history given a uh, sufficient policy response. Uh, let's now turn to the um, Great Recession, which is you know, fresh in everybody's memory. Uh, you know, the first lesson is that it's uh, easier to fix the economy before a financial crisis hits by far. Um, and really, things got much worse for the U.S. and global economies after Lehman Brothers collapsed in September 2008. And, and this was after plenty of warning signs on um, you know the housing uh, the housing sector slowing down and uh, financial stress building up in the economy so it's not something that caught policymakers totally unaware but once Lehman collapsed this sparked a financial crisis that arguably transformed a mere housing bust into the Great Recession as we knew it uh, if policymakers can avoid a financial crisis this time around, dealing with the economic damage of COVID-19 will be much easier. Um, 
Another lesson looking at the right chart is that structural issues make the economy uh, make it much harder for the economy to recover from a recession. And so, looking at the unprecedented ramp up in residential investment as a share of GDP, and then the collapse in the decade following the Great Recession, you know that that was a, um, a structural imbalance in the economy that meant that we couldn't just return to the pre-recession pattern of economic activity um, during the recovery. You know, in contrast with COVID-19, uh, you know, the pattern of economic activity before the recession was fairly sound. So we can essentially return to our, our mode of, of business before the recession rather than having to go through a protracted restructuring as we did after the Great Recession. And, uh, and finally, you know, after, as with the Great Depression, policy mistakes were key in making the Great Recession worse. Um, in addition to allowing a financial crisis to occur, you know, we can also point to um, the turn to austerity away from fiscal stimulus uh, with, uh, with the U.S. and especially the Eurozone pursuing austerity, uh, which arguably constrained the uh, recovery trajectory in the years in the decade following the Great Recession. So we synthesize all of these uh, historical lessons learned into a, a scorecard to gauge the long run economic impact of COVID-19, uh, looking across several dimensions. Probably most importantly right now to focus on is the extremely impressive policy response that we've seen so far, especially the US's historically large fiscal stimulus, um, as I noted earlier. Um, also, we've seen now the, the Eurozone start to uh, give early signs that, that leaders are going to commit to fiscal stimulus there and the, um, the political objections by um, some of the northern European countries like Germany that have roadblocked stimulus in the past uh, are going to be overcome. Um, and uh, likewise, we think right now that the risk of a financial crisis are fairly small given the very aggressive action we've seen by central bankers. Importantly, central bankers are basically unconstrained by the moral hazard quandary, which is the traditional uh, inhibitor to a, an aggressive response to financial crisis in historical scenarios, because essentially moral hazard means that uh, central bankers are, are worried about encouraging bad actors whenever they bail out uh, financial institutions during a financial crisis um, because you know, they don't want to go into the the next economic cycle with um, lower economic efficiency or more weaknesses in the economy because they've in rewarded bad behavior but this time around that that argument doesn't really apply because no economic actor is responsible for the distress that they're they're encountering right now. I mean, the distress is largely the result of a an external cause, which nobody had control over, which is the virus. And so we're seeing relatively uninhibited bailouts and liquidity support for financial markets as a result of that. And that's probably the correct thing to do. And it will probably persist going forward and, and keep the risk of a financial crisis down. And then finally, over underlying structural issues going to the recession pale compared to the economic distortions we saw preceding the Great Recession. Um, in general, the buildup of private debt has been um, much more modest. Uh, we don't see large sectoral imbalances on par with uh, the housing boom prior to the Great Recession. And so there's not a lot of restructuring of the economy that we'll have to do following um, this recession we're seeing as a result of COVID-19. That does it for this week's Investing Insights podcast for Morningstar. We hope you have enjoyed our program and we welcome your feedback. Please send your comments and questions to podcasts at Morningstar.com. From everyone here at Morningstar, thanks for listening. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Opinions expressed are as of the date of recording. Such opinions are subject to change. The views and opinions of guests on this program are not necessarily those of Morningstar Inc. and its affiliates. Morningstar and its affiliates are not affiliated with this guest or his or her business affiliates unless otherwise stated. Morningstar does not guarantee the accuracy or the completeness of the data presented herein. The podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered tax advice. Please consult a tax and or financial professional for advice specific to your individual circumstances.
Morningstar Research Services LLC is a subsidiary of Morningstar Inc. and is registered with and governed by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Morningstar Research Services shall not be responsible for any trading decisions, damages, or other losses resulting from or related to the information, data analysis, or opinions, or their use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. All investments are subject to investment risk, including possible loss of principal. Individuals should seriously consider if an investment is suitable for them by referencing their own financial position, investment objectives, and risk profile before making any investment decision.